we're going to start our discussion with the European Court of Justice's landmark decision in the Schrems 2 case. Uh, and this has essentially been at the core of most of the changes to the data transfer regime that we have seen in the past few months. Um, the case was essentially a rehash of the original Schrems case, which came before the European Court in 2016. Uh, and in that case, the privacy activist Max Schrems brought proceedings against Facebook and successfully brought down the US safe harbor, which was the predecessor of the privacy shield. In Schrems 2, uh, Schrems complained to, the, complained to the Irish courts that Facebook's reliance upon the standard contractual clauses to transfer his personal data from Ireland to the US violated his privacy rights due to the, the broad surveillance powers that uh, the US intelligence agencies are uh, given under US law. Uh, ultimately, this led to the Irish High Court referring a series of questions to the European Court of Justice, uh, including in relation to the validity of the standard contractual clauses and also the privacy shield as lawful transfer mechanisms under the GDPR. Um, when reviewing the case, the European Court made it clear that the key criteria for assessing the validity of the privacy shield and the standard contractual clauses was to ascertain whether these provide a level of protection for personal data, which is essentially equivalent, equivalent to that set out under the GDPR and European law. Um, so with this threshold in mind, uh, the court ruled that the privacy shield does not ensure an equivalent level of protection and therefore ruled that it is not or no longer a valid transfer mechanism. Uh, and there were two main reasons for this. Uh, the first reason was that the court ruled that US surveillance laws go beyond what is necessary in a democratic society. Uh, and the second reason was that the court found that the Privacy Shield framework did not provide individuals with effective rights of redress against US intelligence agencies uh, where their data has been interfered with. Um, so as a result, the, the Privacy Shield is now done and dusted. Uh, if you're still relying on it as a transfer mechanism, then you need to stop doing so and implement an alternative transfer mechanism, uh, or you need to suspend the transfers altogether. Uh, it's also worth bearing in mind that you may also still have references to the privacy shield in your privacy notices, uh, and therefore those references will need to be uh, updated in light of the decision. Um, the second and perhaps even more important element of the European Court's decision in Schrems to relates to the standard contractual clauses. Um, and so the court thankfully did uphold the validity of the SCCs. Uh, and this is obviously a relief uh, given how widely these are relied upon by businesses that transfer data internationally. Uh, but it wasn't all rosy uh, for the SCCs uh, and the court noted certain shortcomings with these. Uh, in particular, the court noted that the standard contractual clauses cannot bind state intelligence authorities, which are not party to the clauses, uh, and nor can they completely override the laws which apply to the data importer in their home country. Uh, so the court therefore ruled that parties to the standard contractual clauses need to check before making any transfers under them as to whether these will be effective in ensuring an equivalent level of protection for the data they are transferring. Uh, this is where the notion of carrying out transfer impact assessments has essentially been born from. Um, the court also ruled that where the results of the transfer impact assessment show that the standard contractual clauses alone will not be enough to guarantee an equivalent level of protection for the data that's being transferred, then uh, certain supplementary measures need to be implemented by the parties to ensure such a level of protection. Uh, so the effect of the court's decision is that now relying on the standard contractual clauses is essentially a much more onerous pro process than was previously treated as being the case. Uh, you can no longer simply treat the standard contractual clauses as a, a tick box exercise, um, which has often realistically been the case up until now. Uh, and now there are additional steps that you need to take in order to rely on these. The only problem was that following the Schrems to a decision, there was a lot of uncertainty as to what was actually entailed in carrying out these additional steps and what was meant by a transfer impact assessment 
and what supplementary measures uh, might be implemented to uh, ensure that added level of protection. Uh, thankfully now, uh, the European Data Protection Board has issued guidance on international transfers post shrimps, uh, and we'll discuss these now on the next slide. And, yeah, thanks, Nigel. Um, so yeah, the, the guidance issued by the European Data Protection Board essentially sets out a, a six-step process which all organisations transferring data outside of Europe must focus on. Um, Notably and importantly, the guidance relates to existing transfers as well as new ones. So it's not just uh, transfers you're making in future that you need to be concerned about. Um, so the, the six step process is uh, set out on the slides, as you can see. Uh, the first step involves identifying all the international transfers that you make. Second step involves identifying the transfer mechanisms you rely on for making those transfers. Uh, and the third step, and this relates only to um, transfers that are made on the basis or are supposed to be made on the basis of standard contractual clauses and binding corporate rules, uh, and it requires you to conduct a, a transfer impact assessment. The fourth step, um, which will apply depending on the results of the transfer impact assessment that you undertake, uh, involves identifying any supplementary measures that are needed to ensure the additional level of protection. Uh, and then the fifth step is um, a procedural step of actually implementing those supplementary measures. The last step involves reviewing transfers at appropriate intervals. Um, so for the purposes of this presentation, we're going to focus on steps three and four, uh, and that's because these are essentially the, the key new steps that have been introduced to the process following the SHREMS 2 decision. Uh, and although these steps are equally relevant to standard contractual clauses, as well as binding corporate rules, we're going to focus more on the standard contractual clauses, given that these are the more common uh, transfer mechanism that's relied on by organisations. So in terms of carrying out a transfer impact assessment, what, what actually is meant by that? Well, the EDPB's guidance says that this essentially amounts to carrying out a review of the laws and the customs which apply in the country of the data importer and assessing whether these would prevent the standard contractual clauses from working properly in relation to the transfer. Um, clearly, not all transfers to one country will be affected in the same way once the data arrives there. Um, and therefore, the European Data Protection Board highlights that different considerations will apply uh, from transfer to transfer. So for example, if you're sending personal data to a, a tech company in the US, then different considerations would apply uh, than would be the case if you're sending uh, medical data relating to a patient to a, a hospital located in the US. Um, you may be thinking that the process for carrying out a transfer impact assessment is not going to be an easy one, uh, particularly for data exporters who probably won't have any presence in the country they're transferring the data to and won't have much or any experience of the laws that apply in that country. Um, as a result, the EDPB suggests that data exporters and data importers will actually need to work together in carrying out the assessment. Um, whether or not data importers will actually be happy to assist in this way is yet to be seen. Uh, you can imagine it being more of a problem for smaller data importers that have less resources. Um, the larger organisations may well have large departments that are able to produce standard material on this. In terms of the relevant laws which data exporters uh, and data importers need to be looking out for, uh, unfortunately, the EDPB's guidance doesn't provide an exhaustive list on this, but they do provide some indicators as to the laws which might be relevant when assessing, when carrying out the assessment. Um, so in terms of positive indicators that can help to demonstrate that a country's laws will allow for the effectiveness of the standard contractual clauses, the European Data Protection Board refers to the factors that are set out in Article 45.2 of the GDPR. Uh, and this relates to the factors that the European Commission would 
assess when uh, deciding whether or not to issue an adequacy decision in relation to a country. Uh, so relevant factors here include the fact that the rule of law is, in, is respected in the country uh, and that there is a, a proper and well-functioning legal system in place in that country, which allows individuals to exercise their rights and seek redress in the events that their rights are violated. Also relevant are uh, the existence of a data protection law and the existence of uh, an independent data protection regulator to oversee that law. In terms of laws that the EDPB suggests could prevent the effectiveness of the SCCs, uh, they refer to laws which would restrict individuals from being able to exercise their data subject rights properly, uh, and laws which would prevent an individual from being able to obtain effective remedies against the importer. However, the, the most, uh, the issue that's given by far the most attention by the European Data Protection Board are the surveillance laws which apply in the country of the data importer. And this is per probably not surprising given that in the Schrems 2 case, so much attention was given by the European Court to US surveillance laws, and it was uh, ultimately found that these go beyond what's necessary in a democratic society. Um, so to help uh, data exporters and data importers evaluate the surveillance laws which apply in the country of the data importer, uh, the EDPB has produced separate guidelines called the European Essential Guarantees. And these are, these are quite detailed and legalistic, and we don't have time to go into them in too much detail, uh, but they set out four key considerations that uh, exporters and importers should take into account when evaluating surveillance laws. Uh, firstly, the surveillance law, the surveillance regime should be based on clear, precise and accessible rules. Secondly, the regime must be necessary and proportionate. Thirdly, there must be an independent oversight mechanism with appropriate checks and balances. And lastly, there must be effective remedies available to individuals. So in light of the EDPB's guidance, it uh, looks like we're all going to have to become experts in non-EU countries, uh, government surveillance regimes, uh, if we want to keep making transfers on the basis of SCCs. Um, and this could be quite an interesting exercise for some countries. Uh, and I would even include the UK in that group uh, following the end of the, the Brexit transition period. Um, once uh, the data import, exporter and data importer have completed the transfer imp impact assessment, the data exporter needs to document this, as is always the case with uh, data protection law. Um, and if the results of the transfer impact assessment shows that the SECs are not enough on their own to ensure an equivalent level of protection, then supplementary measures need to be adopted and implemented.